Hey Mark, how are you? Good, yourself Sam? Awesome. How's South Start been for you so far? South Start's been awesome. The uh, network here from around Australia and locally, uh, it's good to meet people and hear what's going on and uh, learn a couple of things, make some good connections and uh, hear from the people on stage is, is pretty good as well. What kind of uh, got you excited to, to get involved in the first place? Um, I haven't been to Adelaide for like six years. Okay. And uh, I actually met uh, Jason and Danielle in... Well, I met Jason in San Francisco in oh, February wow. this year. Yeah, cool. And he told me that they were resurrecting South Start. And then I met Danielle in Hong Kong. Wow. And uh, with obviously our business being in the conference space, um, it was good to hear that they were resurrecting it and that Adelaide was staying on the Australian map in terms of innovation and mm. the startup space and yeah. Were you over at Rise in Hong Kong? Uh, yeah. Was that was how it yeah, 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 yeah. Good fun. Yeah, cool. Massive. 15,000 people in a hall. Wow. 600 startups. Uh, yeah, it was crazy. Um, so tell us a little bit more about 99 Starts and what you're working on at the moment. Yeah, um, 99 Starts is effectively Netflix for the startup and business community. Okay. We license keynote talks from different conferences around the world, package them up, transcribe them, curate them, summarize them, and then make it available to individuals and teams for a low monthly subscription. Sweet. Well, it's a very good uh, place to be talking about it since we're literally sitting outside we're of a, a keynote right correct. now. Correct. So we're, like, we're a community supporter of, of South Start. Yeah, um, awesome. Which is awesome, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the... Uh, I was just chatting with Craig Swan, um, the event director, just about how things have been going. We had a chat a few weeks ago, sort of looking forward, and he, he was really wanting to create something bigger than just you know just keynotes, something that was sort of um, broke outside of the the actual uh, you know town hall itself and and sparked conversations and got people thinking. I think they've done a really good job. He's definitely done that, and that's for me. You know, the speakers get you in the door, but yeah. it's the experience you have inside the hall and outside the hall yeah. uh, that brings you back next year i think um, uh, given that you sort of <coughs> spend time going to these kind of things around the world like what how does this kind of compare and what are some of the things do you think that uh, you know a, a city like adelaide can do to sort of try and get to the forefront of, of this industry yeah i mean i don't like i don't like comparing conferences sure. because they each need to bring their own unique uh you know flavor mm. i guess to the to the industry that they're focused on uh, but for me i want to see uh, more connections taking place. Yeah. So, like, even like, um, night one was the the speed dating. Like, that's an awesome opportunity to meet a whole bunch of people which I've never seen before at a conference. Yeah. And, and a lot of people love that concept. So that's a, a real quick way to break down barriers um, and get people talking about what they do and meeting each other, and then obviously carrying that through into post talks. Did Did um, you go through and do the, the icebreaker? So I didn't personally, but yeah. I've heard from heaps of people that I went because yeah. um, I only came in that night. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's big. Um, obviously, the lounge where people can meet mm. um, outside of the talks is, is awesome. The night session last night was a bit of fun. It was. <laughs> um, and, you know, it all, it all kind of packages together to create this awesome experience that you're not going to forget and want to come back to and enjoy next time. Yeah. One of the things that uh, a lot of the speakers have been talking about is it's actually nice to come out and, and listen to other people and take some time out of you know what is often a very busy schedule you know as an entrepreneur and, and live, working in these kind of spaces and, and just yeah kind of give yourself a bit of space and then opportunities to, to start these conversations and meet new people we've been enjoying it it's, well, that, uh, that to me I used to do conferences very backwards yeah okay probably five years ago where I'd sit in the room for 90 percent of the time. Mm. And the other 10% of the time, I'd be in the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> so that's not the way you should work. You know, at conferences, it's about meeting people as much as it is about learning from the people on the stage. Yeah. And if you don't get that balance right, you walk away from it being sometimes a little disappointed. The last couple of uh, conferences I've been to, I've forked out the extra cash and bought, you know, whatever the top tier ticket is VIP, VIP yep. so, so you actually get to go to that sort of introductory dinner and, and meet some of the speakers or some of the you know some of the sponsors some of the people that are around it and then I think having that initial kind of uh, you know you sort of form your little you know tribe and you recognize people right and, and then you can go out over the next couple of days and it's easy to have those conversations I think yep. sometimes especially something like a rise um, you know a South by Southwest where there's you know tens of thousands of people literally yeah. um it's pretty difficult to just you know how do you go and start networking how do you have those yeah. conversations i mean so definitely um 
I think VIP tickets are underrated, I, to I be agree. honest. Because yeah. um, that is the difference between an exceptional conference and a good conference. Mm. And, you know, if you do have the opportunity to, to go to a VIP dinner and sit next to, you know, one of the speakers that, you know, is on stage, and yeah. that they can add more value in the space of a 45-minute dinner than the price of that ticket. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I think it's actually going forward, thinking about these kind of conferences, there should almost be, you know, so you've got a VIP, but then kind of like an experience ticket, right, where you, so you can get involved in more things. And even if it's not necessarily the speakers, but, you know, get a group of people from the conference together to go and have lunch or to go and have dinner and Correct. sort of, you know, force a bit of that kind of uh, networking. Yeah, and I think, you know, I kind of... If I look forward five years in terms of where the conference industry is going to go, mm. I think you're either going to have super large conferences yeah. um, or really small micro conferences um, targeting specific niches, but it's very intimate and you learn from each other and the larger conferences are more about the experience and the greater networking and the broader scope of topics that are discussed. You see, so, I mean, South by Southwest is obviously a big example, but, and Craig had talked about this, he doesn't really like the idea the term conference, right? It's more kind of a, a festival or something, you know, it's a... Festival, a summit, yeah, a yeah. this or that. <laughs> what like, do you call it? <laughs> it's, and people are looking for new names now mm. because, you know, conferences overused, summits overused, festivals overused. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, the name doesn't, the name shouldn't, uh, I guess, direct what the event no. is about. But it, it's hard for people... Um, so just to cut in, it is crackling through the whole thing. It's not just your headphones. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know where one of the cables are. They're not on, are they? Um, anyway, all good. Um, I think that when I'm... So the last couple of weeks, we're telling people we're doing this. And they're like, well, okay, so what is it? And sort of saying it's a conference, they're like, oh, about, about what? Uh, you know, oh, text. So, but it's hard to sort of give people, I suppose, the uh, that haven't been before, the, yeah, the breadth and kind of... Because I've been to things where... It has nothing to do with my, you know, day to day work. But you just walk away, you know, it's interesting hearing about what other people are doing and, you know, passionate, excited people that are doing cool shit. Yeah. It's um you know, it just it, it gets you thinking and it gets gets your creative juices flowing. Well my I learn best from people that are outside of my industry. Sure. So whether it's this business or the previous business, I look I look to others in a different industry and I learn from them and I work out ways that I can take what they're doing and apply it to what I'm doing today. Mm. So in the previous business, I was running a, a real estate business, but I would look to the car industry okay. um, or the e-commerce industry and the retail industry and look at what they're doing and bring those insights into our business, uh, which worked for us. Yeah, I think that, I think if, if you can, if you can go outside of your kind of comfort zone and start looking at what other people are doing in parallel, then, I mean, there's so many opportunities there for, like, like you sort of have experienced yourself for, yep. uh, you know, great, great business ideas. Correct. And that's, it's, it's being able to see that opportunity yeah. and then take advantage of it. So, um, I, we were chatting yesterday, but, um, so you're, you're pretty close to, to launching 99 Start, so yeah. Yeah, two weeks away. Awesome. Maybe sooner. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> that's exciting. It's uh, it's been a it's been a long road. It's been uh, there's already been one pivot. Okay. Um, so we kind of launched it in I think November last year, mm. and after about three months, we worked out that the business model, well, there was no business model. Let's face it, um, <laughs> the traction, the scalability. There were so many problems with it, um, and it kind of started as a passion project. Yeah. And I've managed to now turn it into more than a passion project and something that we can obviously generate money from and uh, you know i've i love mentoring people mm. and now this is the ability to mentor hundreds of thousands of people yeah, without cool. me having to do it myself but people that are better better at it than me uh do it so what's your background so uh, you mentioned uh, the, the real estate uh, business that you had before yeah um, what were you doing before that uh not much um <laughs> i was at uni so i did a uh, after school, I, f I did a Bachelor of Construction Management. Okay. Um, and then I worked, uh, and then I went and did a Master's of Finance. And I worked for a company for three months and hated it and uh, left and started my own thing. And uh, that was back in 2007. Yeah, cool. Five years of trial and error, five years of actually building a decent business. Uh, exited that in 2016. Cool. And uh, stupid enough to go again. <laughs> 
what gave you the impetus to go out on your own in 2007? Um, I just saw an opportunity. Um, you know, I was working for, I was in a JV between um, an ASX listed company and a developer, developer. And, you know, in three months in, I had accomplished what I, what they thought it was going to take me a year to do. Yeah, right. Um, and they wanted, I wanted them to go out and keep acquiring sites so I could continue to do what I was doing. Mm. This was pre-GFC, yeah. uh, but getting close. And so the funding sort of dried up for the acquisition opportunities that we were looking for. And uh, yeah, I got exposure to an area of the market that I had never known about and loved it and thought, well, I can do this myself. Nice. Gave it a shot. It took me about six months to earn my first dollar. Um, had a lot of no's, uh, a lot of networking, a lot of trying to build relationships and, and get things off the ground and, and nothing really eventuated for a long time. Mm. Then changed tact and did a bit of mortgage broking to kind of keep me going keep and, and make ends meet. Make some ends meet. And, yeah. and eventually, you know, after five year, four years and four business model pivots, uh, we eventually got the business right um, and we turned it into something that was quite successful. What do you think it, it takes to, um, like if you have to go back and look at the, the study that you did um, and then this journey that you've had for the last 11 years yeah what 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 skills and traits do you wish had been sort of taught during your tertiary education to help you along the road um i'm a generalist yeah so i'm not a, like i'm not an expert at anything but i'm pretty good at most things and my construction management degree was four years yeah and it was generalist we did everything from ethics to economics to physics okay um and I love that degree. Um, so to put it into perspective, I went to a decent school in Sydney, but I came last or second last at school. Yeah. And then I went to uni and I loved doing what I was doing and I came like top 10. Cool. And when you learn, when you're doing something you love, then you excel at it. Mm. And um, so I always thought that I was going to be in, in the construction game, not necessarily the real estate game, but construction. Okay. And I... You know, worked for an interior fit-out company and we did offices and hotels and hospitals and bars and restaurants and all that sort of stuff. And I did that for about four years. And I got to a point where I started off as their very first junior estimator mm. as, a, as a guinea pig and worked, up, worked my way up over four years to a project manager role. And then the next step up was state manager. Yeah. And that wasn't going to be for like... 15 years yeah right so i'm like where how do i progress like where do i take this and i loved working for the company and like we were i think 40 or 50 people at the time okay. and i think by the time i left they were 100 wow um a few years later they were like 300 wow and um but i remember sitting down with my with my state manager at the time asking like you know where's my career progression and like how do i fit into all of this um and then speaking to him about potentially leaving and he's like, go, see ya. Um, I was like really taken aback by it. But he said like, if you're not replaceable, because I'm really important here and you're going to miss me. He's like, no, we're not. Like, you're replaceable, <laughs> just like everyone else. And uh, that really made me start thinking about if I'm replaceable here, I'm probably replaceable Interesting. anywhere. Mm. Um, and I like to do things my way. So... Um, that was kind of the stepping stone to, to go and do some further education. And the dream was to get into Macquarie Bank. Okay. Um, and so that's why I went and did the Masters of Finance. Uh, went and did my interviews with, with Macquarie Bank. Did the two interviews. Met the MD. Yes, 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 yes. Do the psychometric test. Fail. <laughs> no, it's um, not, it's the worst. And uh, I got the results back. Um, based on the test, the psychometric test that we did, and I'm like, this is me spot on. Like, it was actually phenomenal. Yeah, they're, they're actually quite scary. Yeah, it, it was amazing. Mm. And I thought, if you don't want me because of this, then that's fine by me because yeah, this sure. is exactly who I am. Um, and uh, yeah, like it's just kind of evolved from there. You do really have to be a bit of a generalist as a as an entrepreneur. I think like you, you need to be comfortable. So one of the things we've been talking about the last few days is this this need for sort of. Uh, 
well, creativity, what it is really, but agility and you know being able to to quickly jump from from one project to the next or, or pivot quickly, but having the I suppose courage to be able to do that as well and not not being too sort of you know uh, blinded or have blinkers on. Yeah, I think that's where um, a lot of founders actually fail is because they do have the blinkers on. Yeah, and they're not brave enough to acknowledge that they might be heading down the wrong path, mm. or they might think that you know product is more important than sales yep. um, yeah. or, you know, vice versa yep. or not listening to your customer or, you know, a thousand and one different things. So unless you can understand the full picture of what's involved uh, it's, and that's why 90% of startups fail. I it's think ego plays into it a big part, right? People, people it's, it's a product versus sales. People, people have an idea, they build something. Is this going to work? And I'm going to make it work no matter what. Even if so, and we've seen this in, in products that, that we've worked on. One small element might be something that you know seems to be piquing some curiosity. Why don't we just dumb it down to this? This this, this is the thing. Yeah. Uh, forget about all this other stuff. And and, and often founders are like, no, no, this, the, the vision is here. Correct. So I don't I, I don't know if it's ego, if it's just such strong self belief yeah. um, that they are right. And I've been in that camp. Yeah. Um, you know, I was in that camp in November last year when I was launching what was the original idea. Yeah. Um, and I had people tell me that it wasn't going to work and I needed to fail myself because mm. I'm like, oh, I'm going to prove you wrong. <laughs> so what, that going back to the, my a question about, about uni and, and just study in general, one of the things we were talking about is that you don't get enough opportunity to fail. You don't get enough opportunity to, to you know, and, and maybe maybe it's different in, in certain degrees, but actually go through a, you know, a, a project or a process where, where failure is, you know, a good part of it, right? And, and that you can learn from your mistakes. But you can't. I mean, you fail uni and you yes, don't get your yeah, degree. Right. And so how does that work? Yeah. <laughs> you can't learn from failure. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I failed one subject at uni mm. uh, because... I did an assignment and they asked for six references and I only gave them five. Yeah, right. uh, so they gave me zero mm. and that made me fail that course. Wow. And uh, I never redid that course. Um, I just fought it for two years <laughs> um, until they, they acknowledged that it was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think they ended up giving me like a distinction or something. Yeah, wow. Um, and that's because I just... You know, I believed in something and I kept fighting, fighting, fighting because it was the principle of the matter. Mm. Um, and for them, it was, you know, it was just stupid. Awesome. So if uh, people want to find out about 99 Starts, what the, where do they need to go? Yeah, 99starts.com or uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm, I love talking to other founders and hearing what they're doing as well. Awesome. Thanks so much for having a quick chat. No worries. Cheers. Cheers, mate.